Welcome to this UKLFI Charitable Trust webinar on Iran and the balance of power in the Middle East. This week, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the breakout time for Iran to produce fissile material for a nuclear weapon had come down to a matter of weeks. The current American administration has been focused on renewing the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, the JCPOA which lifted sanctions on Iran in return for promised limitations on its nuclear program. Negotiations stalled several weeks ago after leaks that US negotiators had accepted Iran's demand to lift the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps designation as a terrorist organization. And there was widespread outrage over proposals by the State Department negotiation team to funnel billions of dollars into a terrorist regime that's launched countless attacks against American and Western interests and regularly declares its intention to wipe Israel off of the map. And also that negotiators appear to continue to disregard the interests uh, and issues of intercontinental ballistic missiles, Iran's recent plots to murder the former National Security Advisor John Bolton and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and its continued sponsorship of terrorism throughout the Middle East. In this context, and to discuss the practical and legal implications of these developments and the proposed agreements, it's my pleasure to introduce leading experts on Iran, Professor Shaul Korev and Dr. Efrat Sofer. Rear Admiral Professor Shaul Korev is the former head of the Israel Atomic Energy Commission, and former Deputy Chief of Naval Operations. He's also the Director of Maritime Policy and Strategy Research at the Esri Center for Iran and Gulf States Research. He's held several senior positions in the Israeli Defense Establishment, including Assistant to the Minister of Defense for Nuclear, Biological and Chemical Defense, and Commanding Officer of the Haifa Naval Base. We're also joined by Dr. Efrat Sofer, who chairs the Board of Advisors at the Esri Center for Iran and Gulf States Research at the University of Haifa. She is Director of UK Lawyers for Israel and an advisor on foreign policy in the Middle East. Efrat's PhD at the LSE saw her specializing in Israeli foreign policy towards Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, please put any questions you may have into the Q&A facility for our discussion in due course. Professor Khorev, we are delighted to begin with a presentation from you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to participate the second time here. And uh, I'll try to go through the presentation very fast in order to leave some time for a Q&A. So let's start. And as I mentioned the last time, Iran's position is a revisionist force in the new balance of power in the Middle East. It's from uh, the revolution time, and uh, when we are speaking about the revolution states, it describes the states whose objective is to change or to put an end to the current system uh, in this matter in the Middle East. And you can see also Iran's statehood, ideological factor, the gain of the revolution, and I think that we would like today to emphasize on the RRGC, which makes about 10% of Iran overall armed forces, is independent of Iran regular army and tasked with safeguarding the Islamic uh, Republic. I'll touch on uh, two main issues. Uh, first, Iran's destabilizing role in the region. Second, Iran nuclear program. And I'll not touch on the Iran ballistic missile and the UAV, even though it's a uh, quite important in this time. So try to emphasize on the Iranian Revolution uh, Guard, I would like to show you that uh, the budget, which is a declining budget for the armed forces of Iran in 2022, it's an increasing budget for the IRDC. And it appears that uh, Iran assumes that uh, nothing will emerge from the nuclear talks in Vienna and that the country will not be more successful than it has been evading the US uh, sanctions. So these are the figures and you can see 
that even though the, the budget for the 2022 is decreasing, the IRGC will get a bigger share. And what is the meaning of such a bigger share? Uh, you can see that the figures of or the numbers uh, 22 billion uh, US dollars. And what I would like to mention is that the IRGC is through its use of proxy militias, which names the Houthis, Hezbollah, and other organizations, the drones, unconventional naval warfare, and missile cost effectively provides the Iran the ability to inflict costs on its neighbor to ensure this deterrent capability, as seen from the attack on Saudi Arabia, oil processing facility, UAE, Pajura, oil port, among others. Two roots of uh, the IRGC resources and capability and Iran influence in the Middle East. The first one is the Northwest route through Iraq, unstable state, through Syria, unstable state, and trying to arrive to the middle, uh, Mediterranean shores, and the Southwest, uh, which is the, also to the south end of the Red Sea, namely the Babel Mandel Strait. And the IRGC can further keep their edge for any external attack or internal disruption, both by failed nuclear talks, as well lost resources and possible upcoming brinkmanship adventures in a regional operation theater. So speaking about the Eastern Mediterranean, and you can see what is their ambition to reach this area and Israel try to prevent them doing day by daily attacks on infrastructure in Syria and the, uh, the, the, the region. In the entrance to the Red Sea, they are uh, operating the Houthi forces, and in the uh, from 2017 to 2021, the forces executed 24 successful or attempt maritime UAV attacks, and uh, with most of those attacks clustered around Yemeni ports such as Hudeda, Salif, directed at the commercial vessel such as oil track uh, tankers. Speaking more specifically about Israel, there was what called shadow war, the Israeli Navy trying to block the export of Iranian oil to Syria and to Hezbollah, and they retaliated by attacking Israeli ships in the area which is remote from Israel, in the Gulf of Aden, and the, in the entrance to the, to, to the Hormoz Strait, to the Persian Gulf, and the last event was in July 2021, 20, uh, when they attacked the Mercedes Street and they killed two sailors on board. And you can see the damage that they caused the ship, but they uh, harmed what we call freedom of navigation of Israel. And it was done by the IRGC. So it's a proxy of Iran operating in this area, harming freedom of navigation of Israel ships. And as you know, Israel trade is amount to 99% of its all trade. So what come out of this is that uh, Israel uh, absorbed to the central command. And I think it's good because uh, the central command is responsible for all, all these areas. Till the Abraham Accord, the countries here rejected the possibility that Israel will be under the central command, even though it's more nature, but now we are incorporated into the central command and especially with the uh, fifth fleet and the, the, the exercise is only uh, one dimension to, 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 uh, uh, to inflict power. So you can see here, it is from April 7th, uh, uh, some kind of exercise between the Israeli Navy and the US fleet. And here you can see our chief of staff, the Israeli Navy, CNO, and the fifth fleet command. So that means that Israeli Navy can cooperate with the fifth fleet in order to maintain its freedom of navigation in remote area that the Israeli Navy can't operate. So uh, 
I'll try to uh, continue with the Iranian demand to leave U.S. designation of IRGC as terrorist organization. And uh, you can see that Trump administration withdrew the U.S. from the deal of the, in the 2018 and blacklist progress terrorist organization in 2019. Iran currently identified that the Biden administration is yearning to have such kind of a, a, a signature or nuclear deal with them. So they understand that if they will insist that the, the issue of the IRGC will be taken out from the list of terrorist organization, it might be a success for them. And the indirect uh, uh, negotiation between the US and Iran in Vienna were paused six uh, uh, weeks ago with the resumption, no resumption inside. The Biden administration plans to reject an Iranian demand that the United States lift its designation of the IRGC as terrorist organization as a condition for renewing the 2015 nuclear deal putting inflation of the deal in jeopardy. And Israel is trying to push the US not to surrender and not to agree to such a term. And the US, I think that when they are mentioning that Iran is very close to the bomb, one of their intention is to put the pressure on Israel to agree to it, but I think that the delegation from Israel arrived to, the, to Washington to discuss is, this issue at this weekend will succeed to prevent the U.S. to uh, lift the sanctions of, from the IRGC. Or, uh, the second issue that I would like to mention is the uh, Iran nuclear uh, program. And uh, as you mentioned, as you know, Iran nuclear program didn't start uh, only the last uh, decade. You can follow it 30 years of such an activity because for Iran, nuclear program is a symbol of power. And the uh, nuclear program is also a symbol of national prestige throughout the public. And nuclear as an insurance certificate against external threat. I think that they started from the North Korean model and they know once they will have a nuclear uh, uh, capabilities, it will give them some kind of insurance as North Korea have, and in case they will have uh, put uh, under a pressure, they can use this tool to, to uh, against uh, the, the such a pressure. Uh, so when we are speaking about the, the, the situation of a nuclear state, there are four main steps. First, fabrication with weapon design and assembly, nuclear explosive testing, and weapon integration. You can see it in this uh, scheme. First one, and Iran is concentrated on this issue, is the enrichment facility. And currently, I'll, say, I'll tell you what amount of uh, enriched uh, uh, uranium they have. Second one is uh, to acquire weapon design. And as far as we know, in 2003, the Iranian made some kind of uh, uh, experiment, even though it was only simulation, but uh, it shows that they know how to uh, uh, design such a nuclear device. Third one is to build and to test the weapon. I'm not sure that they will go to test it. They can be, uh, let's say, a threshold country without testing, and then to make it to the delivery system. In this case, the Shihab 3 has all the capability as a delivery system for such a weapon. The nuclear deal stopped Iran, and I think that one of the best thing was that the quantity of uh, enriched uranium was only 300 kilo or 60 libras. And it was 3.7% and not more. So by the graph, I think that the nuclear deal, in some aspect, was good to stop Iran nuclear program. What was not uh, uh, agreed in the what we call the nuclear deal or joint uh, plan of uh, cooperative action is this 
issues and also their list sanctions were not mentioned in the uh, 2015 deal. So you can see what was outside the deal. And uh, when we are speaking about the deal, there are various stages or phases. The first one will end in 2015, and it will have uh, only 5,060 centrifuge in the past, can reach only 300 kilo. The second one, you can see it here, and then what is missing in this deal is the advanced centrifuge that can give an Iranian capability to uh, produce more enriched uranium once they have finished to develop it. U.S. withdrawal from the deal, it was uh, Trump pushed by uh, Israel, and I'm not sure that it was a good step. Anyway, the U.S. now is outside uh, the deal. When we are speaking about uh, uh, Iran and the analysis of IRA verification and monitoring approach of March, we know that Iran is quite close to the amount of enriched Omanium that is sufficient to one bomb. So as February 19, Iran had a stock of 32, 33 kilo of 60 enriched uranium in uranium mesh. And when they will achieve 40 kilo of 60% enriched uranium, they will have sufficient for a one bomb. So you can see it as a uh, this is uh, some kind of uh, forecast for as of May uh, uh, 1st, uh, how many weeks. So we are speaking about uh, weeks that they will produce a, a, a sufficient amount of fissile material for one bomb, two bombs, three or four or five uh, uh, bombs. I was asked to speak about the safeguard agreement with the IAEA inspectors. And uh, Iran had some kind of safeguard agreement, even though they didn't answer the question ab about the military dimension of Iran a program prior to the 2015 deal. But after the assassination of Soleimani, Iran uh, went out of this agreement and didn't give uh, given access to the uh, IAEA inspector to decide by itself. By the end of December 2021, the IAEA had installed the cameras to replace those remotes from the workshop at Karad. But I would like to mention that uh, speaking about enrichment facility, it can be in remote places. It can be in hangars. It can be in uh, 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 covered uh, uh, areas. So when speaking about the capabilities of IAEA to monitor and to safeguard the Iranian program, a program, it's up to the Iranian, even if they want to hide something, they can do it even though they are, uh, uh, they have some kind of agreement. So uh, when we're speaking, I should mention, and I also recommended it to then Bibi Netanyahu, and when he was uh, uh, the prime minister, that the weak point of the joint comprehensive plan of action was the improved centrifuge. Because when you are speaking about the time to enrich, once you have the IR6 or IRA, they can reach the amount of enriched material that they need in a shorter period of time. And uh, uh, Iran is also continued to develop potentially nuclear capable missiles, impose no restriction of its missile uh, program. Another issue that I would like to mention is the impact of Russia Ukraine campaign. And uh, Iran, uh, Russia, which was uh, or which supported the, the, the nuclear deal with the US has abandoned the recent attempt to exploit Vienna talk to gain sanctions relief beyond what was guaranteed in the 2015 uh, uh, deal. Russia doesn't want Iran to become a nuclear weapon because it might pose also a threat to Russia. But uh, Russia has uh, some kind of a trade 
and technical relation with Iran, and they gain a lot of money through this. So Russia uh, policy is to maintain crises that can be controlled and hinder the improvement of Iran-West relation. The Iran-Russia agreement hasn't uh, had much economic benefit for Iran so far. Trade with Russia is currently accounts for only 4% of Iran's import and 2% of Iran's export, only about $4 billion a year. Uh, the government of uh, President Raisi seeks to utilize a 25-year cooperation agreement with China to bolster the look to the East policy, and China is rely very heavily on Iran, uh, uh, let's say, uh, energy uh, product. Uh, in March 5th, uh, Russia demands for a written guarantee from the United States that trade with Iran not be affected by the new U.S sanctions imposed on Russia, and uh, the U.S. agreed to it. Iranian official has refrained from condemning the Russian invasion to Ukraine and, uh, reasonably. And here you can see the new alliance of Russia, China, Iran, with an annual, uh, let's say, naval, naval uh, exercise symbolizing that the uh, they are protecting the freedom of navigation. And uh, the increasing security cooperation reflects the reinforced closer relation among the three uh, governments. Uh, with conclusion, I'm sure that uh, Iran, a nuclear Iran, will change the geopolitical situation in the Middle East and pose an existential threat to Israel. Uh, I'm sure that uh, once I'm sure that Iran have a rational leadership, but rational leadership, it depends what are the price that they are willing to pay to, let's say, to emulate the, the state of Israel. And if in the Iraq-Iran war, one million people uh, were uh, uh, killed or died in such a war, for a leadership of Iran, one million Iranian if Israel will retaliate, will be uh, sufficient to be, uh, let's say, to justify uh, uh, that uh, they will uh, then Israel. US Iran uh, negotiate to restore nuclear deal, but on different terms. And the withdrawal of the Trump administration, I thought then, and I still think from the nuclear deal encouraged by Israel, did not yield the anticipated result. Israel must not place itself alone at the far front of the campaign against Iran. I think that if this is the policy, it's a wrong policy. We should mention that uh, Iran is uh, a danger to the, the whole Middle East. We should uh, also uh, form a regional coalition of like-minded countries that Iran poses threat to and use this coalition as a counterweight to Iran radical axis. And I think that Israel should continue its covert campaign against Iran nuclear program in order to delay. It will not uh, stop it. It might delay it. And if something will happen with this regime or with the, uh, uh, the understanding that they are not, uh, that it will not be the benefit of Iran to go to a nuclear weapon, such a covert campaign will delay. Israel must continue to maintain its military freedom of action in the region and has stepped up cooperation with the U.S. Central Command. As I mentioned it, uh, for not only from the freedom of navigation of Israeli trade, but for other purposes as well. And I got a question here, and I would like to uh, answer it. The question was, uh, how do you see a poem Sorry. Shall we How do you see upon Iran obtaining its military nuclear capability? Israel and Saudi Arabia respond to Iran incitement and aggression through Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, or even through so-called nuclear lone wolf scenario. Uh, I, tr I try to chat here Thomas Schelling, Nobel laureate, 
who was uh, one of the first who tried to deal with the gen theory of the nuclear weapon. And he mentioned one thing, that uh, one thing a person cannot do, no matter how rigorous his analysis or heroic his imagination, is to draw up a list of things that would never occur to him. So here, my question is, if Iran will obtain a nuclear weapon, I think that it will change the geopolitical situation in the Middle East. I think that uh, Israel will be in a constant threat. I am not afraid about a lone wolf scenario because wolf, a lone wolf scenario, which was a, a Bauma notion, is that you will give a nuclear weapon to a terrorist organization and they will do such a thing by a, a lone wolf scenario. I think that the, a nuclear Iran will be sufficient to deter Israel, to limit its freedom of operation in the Middle East, and it will be a very bad, uh, uh, a very bad situation, not only for Israel, but for the whole region. Thank you very much. Well, Shaul, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've already had quite a few questions arising from your presentation. Um, I shall save the rest of them for, for the discussion. Uh, please, if anyone has joined us in the interim, put your questions into the Q&A facility uh, and I shall be able to put them to both of our speakers. Um, Efrat, uh, we'd be delighted to hear your comments before we move on to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha, and thank you, Shaul. Always a, an honour and a pleasure to share a platform with you both. Um, I thought I would share a few thoughts on um, lessons from the past for engaging with Iran and, and thwarting Iranian activity in the region. Um, when looking at the future today, I hear echoes of the past and I'd like to take a moment, uh, for instance, to ponder a quote from the Shah of Iran that he made in June of 1974. Um, that, the national, that how the national security of Iran may be best served by possessing a nuclear deterrent. He said, if in this region, each little country tries to arm itself with armaments that are pre precarious, even elementary, but nuclear, then perhaps the national interests of any country at all would demand it to do the same. The Shah did add to placate his international allies, he said, um, but I would find that that completely ridiculous. So this, this is a very interesting point to start where um, even the Shah of Iran looked into a nuclear option, but perhaps with different motives. First and foremost, I'll always begin by saying um, the, something that, that, that doesn't always kind of coincide with the matter at hand these days. The relations with the Iranian government um, under the Pahlavis was the polar opposite. Israel and the West engaged with Iran to thwart the pan-Arabist threat pre-1979. And Israel enjoyed relations with Iran uh, as very unlikely bedfellows uh, with thriving oil, trade, intelligence cooperation, defense cooperation, and excellent relations in, in non-military matters such as agriculture, education, technology, etc. And the, 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 the current crisis does not, I believe, reflect the, um, the West's relations with the Iranian people themselves. They are educated, outward-looking, engaged, curious. And so it is, it is the um, Iranian government that we're coming up against here. It's interesting also to note that the same geopolitical elements since 1948 still exist, such as uh, Russia, then the Soviet Union, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, uh, the Kurds, Saudi Arabia and the US and, and the rest of Europe. In the nearer past and present, there are also lessons to note from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, um, as, as Shaul mentioned, in dealing with Khamenei and with Ibrahim Raisi. First, uh, first kind of matter that, that came to mind is that the ba balance of power has, has flipped on its head with a new paradigm since the Abraham Accords. So whereas in the past, um, Israel and the West have been aligned with Iran to throw to um, thwart the Pan-Arabist threat, it is now uh, Israel, the West and the Gulf countries and the Abraham Accords who, who have come together 
and uh, the Arab narrative has been transformed in normalizing relations with Israel to balance against the Iranian threat, uh, as well as other reasons, excellent reasons to, um, to support collaboration and co coexistence and trade. And so, um, uh, one very interesting thing when, when there was a, a mention of, of um, cooperation and defense cooperation, in the past there, there were um, initiatives between Iran and Israel, such as the uh, Tool project, which was at its peak, ironically, in the, in the, in the late 70s, uh, where um, Iranian oil and money was exchanged with Israel um, to collaborate on uh, defense technological um, endeavors, which is very interesting. Um, and I think that increasing, and you contrast that with, compare it to today, and there is increasing Israeli and Emirati and Bahraini defense cooperation, which is demonstrating the, the blossoming of a strategic friendship. All hangs now in the balance with the Iranian demand that the USA remove the IRGC as an FTO, a foreign terrorist organization, as a part of the new Iran deal. The IRGC has already been prescribed um, since uh, 2019, as well as Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, who also prescribed the IRGC as a terrorist organization. Um, and even though this is coming into jeopardy and uh, the US, I believe, should not remove the IRGC from the FTO, um, lawyers can still consider and have a duty to consider Iranian human rights violations within the legal mechanisms um, to hold the Iranian regime to account for its uh, heinous human rights abuses. The UK government, for example, has committed to considering a range of other targets under its human, global human rights sanctions regulations. And um, given that the IRGC and its leadership have committed terrorist acts against the United Kingdom, for example, British nationals and human rights abuses against minorities, women, journalists, and opposition activists, and many others um, that the IRGC targets should also be included in any upcoming trance of sanctions um, under any new mechanism. Indeed, Sweden, we can see a global example where Sweden, for example, has arrested a suspected Iranian war criminal, Hamid Nouri, under universal jurisdiction laws in his role in the massacre in Tehran of 5,000 political prisoners in which Ibrahim Raisi was also involved. And we need to also refocus. Um, the entire region has global significance. The connections that can be used to stabilize and destabilize the region very quickly. Iran's alliance network pre-revolution helped to stabilize the region. Overnight, the revolutionaries overturned Iranian foreign policy and transformed its strategy into becoming a rogue regime and weaponizing instability with the establishment of the IRGC in April 1979 and thwarting international law. The credible show of Iranian warfare via proxies in Lebanon and Syria, as Shaul um, explained to us, we can see parallels in the approach of Russia to Ukraine, where some of the tactics have been used that we are likely to see in the Iranian case when dealing with Khamenei and Raisi. And these um, go beyond the, the military sphere. And we see a new front in, in, in this conflict, which we should be aware of. For instance, the West cannot afford to be naive and must take threats of leaders at their word. We see this from the Russia-Ukraine example, where Putin, for example, wrote an essay last year sharing his imperious plans for Ukraine that was dismissed as internal posturing by the, by the West. And ignoring this warning sign has partly got us to where we are with Ukraine. Similarly, Khamenei's February 2019 manifesto, his second phase for the Islamic Revolution, that among other visions was of purifying Iran and strengthening the IRGC to help realize Raisi's grand vision and civilizational ambitions of becoming the Persian Empire once again. It would have been inconceivable to see a Western country invade another. 
it is not inconceivable to see Iranian full-scale attack, and we must safeguard against it while we can. Another front that will need to be seriously considered in opposing the Iranian aggression is the use of information and in social media. This is a very powerful tool that takes public diplomacy to a new level. It goes well, well beyond effective asbara and um, public relations. It's, a, it's now a strategic goal. And Iranian bots, for example, on, are featured regularly in social media. And so when anything happens in the Middle East, uh, a flurry of social media activity happens in platforms such as Facebook and Instagram that um, greatly affects facts on the ground. And so uh, legally, this needs to be ad addressed with a multi-pronged approach. Iran also deploys de divisive tactics to disturb the internal fabric of states. And this has been seen on a violent scale by Hezbollah in Lebanon. And there's been evidence of Iran attempting to do the same in Israel in order to push the narrative of Israel as an apartheid state. Iran has targeted religious Jewish Israelis to attempt to cause them to incite violence against Arabs. Equally disturbing, Iran's strategy to destroy Israel and manipulate the international media. Recent studies have uh, shown that an influx of weapons by Iranian proxies have made their way to flame inter-Arab um, violence in, within Israel. And the illicit trade in, in uh, weaponry and drugs that Iran supports throughout the region destabilizes the region and must be addressed somehow. For example, crime rates with inter-Arab violence within Israel has gone up. In 2013, there were uh, 58 reported homicides, but by 2020, that number stood at 97. This is a staggering increase. And 95% of the smuggling from Lebanon is directed by Hezbollah, Iran's uh, Lebanese proxy. Some of the arms are also being smuggled across the Jordanian border, which also needs to be addressed. The weapons, while destined for Israeli Arab crime organizations, would also be available for terror attacks in the event of another surge of violence between Jews and Arabs. And so the Iranian, Iranian influence goes well beyond um, the interstate level. The IRGC's extensive criminal network utilizes Iran's numerous terrorist proxies and connections to the underworld to run guns, drugs, oil, ivory, and a host of other illicit goods. And the shift from drugs to weapons is increasing daily. And this is something that needs to also be addressed in conjunction with Iran's uh, penchant for, for missiles, um, both in range and in number which must be addressed in any, uh, in any upcoming deal. And so uh, the rationality is being tested every day and we need to hold firm and strong and to be uh, smart, both legally and tactically in this. And um, I always like to end with, with Rumi. Um, he he always, always seems to, um, to, to speak sense. And he says, the message behind the words is the voice of the heart. We must listen. We must listen and take leaders at their word and um, remain strong. Thank you so much. Akrap, thank you so much for those insights. Um, perhaps I can begin with looking at the 2015 agreement uh, with you, Shaul, and with Efrat. Um, what, what do we make of reports that that agreement was not uh, being stuck to? Iran wasn't sticking to its side of the bargain, um, and of course also the difficulties with enforcement, um, as well as the monitoring that you did reference in your presentation. Shaul, what about those criticisms of the 2015 JCPOA? I think that you're right about the verification and safeguard, but uh, I think that the IEA has a very good tool to do this, uh, let's say, uh, assignment but they don't have the intelligence. And as I mentioned, you should assume that Iran is uh, continue to do their covert, uh, let's say, enrichment facilities, other nuclear activities in a covert uh, uh, area. 
So once signing such a deal, I think that uh, all the signatures should uh, uh, support the IAEA with intelligence. The intelligence that the US, Israel, Great Britain, France, Germany has might help to go to places that there is a covered uh, uh, program. So I think that the reaching an agreement is a good idea. I think that uh, we should uh, also think about the plan B, what will be if there will be no an agreement. And I think that uh, if there will be an agreement, we should uh, try to strengthen this agreement by giving intelligence to the safeguard, verification, and all the systems that the IEA might use to monitor the Iranian program. Efrata, another one of the big criticisms of the JCPOA is that, of course, it only focused on the nuclear capability at the expense of both the Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles Program, but also, importantly, you were focusing on the destabilization of the region, Iranian influence, and proxy terror groups. Um, it's not clear that uh, whatever new agreement is proposed, given that we all expect it to be based on the 2015 uh, text, whether any new agreement would take those factors into consideration. Uh, how big a problem is that in uh, grappling with Iranian influence at large? Thanks, Natasha. It's it's a huge it's a huge uh, blind spot that that occurred in the in the 2015 uh, deal, where I feel that that the context wasn't considered in its entirety, where the the grave danger of the, the missiles be there be they you know, be they uh, inter, intercontinental the ballistic missiles and all of the other weaponry and as well as Iran's proxy uh, proxy endeavors are are one of the most dangerous as dangerous as the nuclear threat and the the destabilization was was not uh, mentioned to to in, in the way that it it deserves to be mentioned. And hopefully that that you know, we hope and pray that that would be uh, also addressed in 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 the new deal. That wouldn't hold my breath, but um, it's it is something that that must be considered and considered very sternly, as well as uh, the timetable, of course, um, of, of any new deal, um, so that that so that any technological advances would be put into um, would be put into consideration. And uh, because technology has moved on and Iran has invested a huge amount into researching and producing and stockpiling um, rockets and missiles. And so that it is a very, very dangerous, makes, makes the, that part of the world a very dangerous place as well. So following on from that, um, and perhaps we shouldn't see the nuclear program and um, Iran's uh, influence and, and support for terror in silos. Um, of course, were it to obtain uh, nuclear capability, that would provide it with uh, an umbrella where it uh, might feel enabled to step up the activities that, that you spoke about um, in your presentation. Uh, and on that, uh, Cheryl, one of the questions that's come through, I think perhaps ties into that, um, of what a nuclear Iran would look like um, in terms of influence in the region. It, it need not use that capability but just having it might embolden it. Uh, the question is would the panel comment on the possibility and or likelihood of Iran not using missiles to launch nuclear weapons on Israel but rather supplying their proxies uh, the bombs or means to make them uh, to uh, to launch dirty bombs on Israel. Now, I appreciate you dealt with that in the context and um, perhaps of the lone wolf scenario um, but further uh, to that, what would a nuclear umbrella mean for Iranian proxies uh, in their activities against Israel? First of all, I think that uh, giving the nuclear, what called the dirty bomb to proxies is not a good idea because uh, I think that after such an event will happen, that all the fingers will be pointed on Iran. So it is not the case and the, the, the effect of the uh, Dirty bombs is not uh, like uh, a, a nuclear bomb. The umbrella, that means that if you want to do something, for instance, if you want to attack Iranian infrastructure in Syria, 
or if you want to retaliate to missile attack on Israel, conventional missile, you should bear in mind that uh, the retaliation for the Iranian will be to use nuclear weapons. So it's a deterrent. It's not a, an action. It's a state of mind. And once the Israeli leaders will be in such a condition, it will be affected what will be the uh, operations that will be li very limited very much by this operation. It will encourage states in the region to cooperate with Iran. You can see the sign without a nuclear weapon that Saudi Arabia tried to go to some kind of cooperation with Iran with regard to the embargo. We know that China get Iranian oils through the Emirate state. So when states become aware that the U.S. retreating from the region, mm -hmm. Iran is becoming a power, they start to negotiate because they don't want to be alone. So when you are mentioning the umbrella, once Iran will have a nuclear weapon, then it will affect the, the Middle East very much, and especially the Gulf states region. In addition to it, I would like to mention that uh, we didn't mention or didn't touch the interior, interior uh, situation in Iran. I think that in parallel to the in any kind of agreement, uh, the like-minded country should support opposition organization in Iran to see whether you know, the Green Revolution of 2009 was not supported by the West. They will stay alone. So in parallel, the West should encourage positive, quotation mark, power within Iraq to try and to change the regime. Which is, of course, exactly what the original sanctions were uh, were aimed at achieving. Um, Efrat, you uh, did speak about the internal situation and the the human rights abuses, the rife. Every few years, we, we do see a, a wave of protests um, within Iran. There's always talk and, and optimism that that this may be a turning point. But uh, we always come to the point where those protests are either uh, stamped out or dissipate. Um, in terms of the human rights situation, um, and you spoke of some of the appalling human rights abuses, what can we make of, say, in 2020, the UN Human Rights Council um, praising Tehran um, in its periodic review of Iran's human rights record, remarking on Iran's record of protecting rights of vulnerable groups and its openness uh, to dialogue? In terms of Shaul's call for Western countries to uh, support opposition groups, it, it rather looks as though uh, the international community, through the UN in particular, is doing the exact opposite. It's um, yeah, well, I, I, it's it's uh, completely out of order for for UN human rights bodies to be encouraging the regime and its uh, its its human rights status. It th there are numerous numerous. Um, uh, accounts of of different uh, very uh, famous and, and and anonymous personalities who are who are summarily executed without without due process, and um, th there is there was one uh, remarkable um, uh, story of Navid Afkari who was a champion wrestler Iranian wrestler who was uh, stitched up for uh, for a crime when he was found in a political protest uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, before his death, he, he, uh, he smuggled out a testimony where he said that his, uh, his confession was uh, obtained under torture and um, that he did not receive any representation. And this, this is just one of the well-known uh, accounts and um, the Iranian government's treatment of, of, uh, of, of the, the gay community of, of other minorities is, is just um, horrific. And what's also interesting is that the, the rhetoric seems to be evolving when there are protests within Iran, that um, it's, 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 in, it's internal, that Iranians are resenting the Iranian government's wasting of their money on these foreign adventures. 
And so when we see, as Shaul mentioned, that the IRGC receives $22 billion this year, which is double the amount that it received last year. If I were an Iranian with, with, uh, with, with power outages, with, with food shortages, I'd be wondering what my leaders were doing with, with uh, the state money. Well, um, squandering of, of uh, Iranian money uh, is one question. We, we've had another question from the audience as to American funds. Uh, why does the current American government seek to fund Iran at the expense of the American taxpayer when it is so evident what the intentions of the Iranian religious Islamist government are and the Iranian government regards America as public enemy number one or the big Satan, uh, either the American government uh, well, the, the, I'm afraid the question trails off, but either the American government has to be foolish, which is difficult to believe, or is there a, an alternative? Um, is it uh, the this administration's concept of real politique that it continues um, to, to seek a, some form of alliance with an organization? Uh, we talked in the introduction about the plots uh, to kill uh, Pompeo, uh, and um, more recently, of course, uh, even today, uh, further plots against some Western diplomats and an Israeli diplomat in, in Turkey were revealed. Um, so what can we make show all of, of the Americans continuing to fund, um, use US taxpayer money in this context? I think that the, uh, the Biden administration is trying to uh, fulfill them what uh, the people in the US uh, uh, think after, let's say, 20 years of uh, trying to uh, be invested in the Middle East, trying to uh, transfer Iraq to a democracy, trying to change Afghanistan. And they fail. And the US citizen decided that they don't want uh, that uh, the US will be involved in the Middle East. So there are only alternatives and you have to choose. But beside, I think that the, the negotiation with the Iran and have some kind of a deal is the, not the worst one because it will prevent Iran to become a nuclear weapon state. But then you have to decide what to do. In 2015, the US com uh, companies, as well as the French company, as well as the German companies, as well as the UK companies, were rushing to Iran to sign deals after the signature of the, of the, the, the nuclear deal. So it's, you have to select an alternative. It's not the best one. There are not the, the alternative. There is not the best alternative. But then you should have a policy how to proceed with it. And if uh, 2025, the 10 years of this deal is going to be finished, you have to select what you want to do. You have enough time to prepare yourself and not to do it under pressure. So that's my idea how to proceed with it. Uh, and the, tax, the US taxpayer, as well as the, uh, the Western taxpayers are paying Iran for their oil, for their industry, and all such things after the restriction will be lifted. So alternatives, there are not best alternatives. You have to select and to see what is the best for the time being and to have a policy how to proceed with it. Well, especially as you say that uh, the covert um, nuclear program continues uh, with or without the existence of, of a deal. Um, so I, I hear uh, your concerns on that. And I take on board also um, what you say uh, that Israel must not place itself alone at the forefront of the campaign. And um, you also say that the covert campaign that many have said Israel is uh, continuing to wage vis-a-vis -vis, um, the centrifuges, uh, nuclear scientists, um, you say that covert program can only delay uh, the advance of Iran's nuclear program, it cannot destroy it. So those, all those things considered, um, where does Israel go from here if, if the uh, others in the international community do seem to abandon um, the, the, the wider issue of um, preventing nuclear capabilities as a whole and opt for these sorts of agreements 
uh, that may just drag out the process. Um, what are Israel's alternatives? And in particular, if I can pose a, a further question from the audience, given Iran's stated intention to wipe out Israel, should Israel consider military action to prevent Iran from going nuclear? Shachual, can I ask you to deal with that first and then perhaps we'll come to Rifat? I think that you're right. All the time, Israel should have the plan B. That's what I try to mention. Plan B is when you see that uh, Iran is reaching the bomb, to see by military action how to prevent it. Should Israel be the only and the only to do it? No, I don't think so. Israel should prepare itself, but I think that the, the only superpower that can destroy Iranian infrastructure, nuclear infrastructure, is the U.S. So I think that Israel should encourage the U.S. to have a plan B by itself, and later it should uh, go to the U.S. and, uh, let's say, uh, present it with some evidence that uh, it will be, be no late to do such a thing. So uh, negotiating with Iran the deal, you should have all the time the plan B. And to maintain, let's say, a significant plan B, you should invest the money because the Iranians are not full. They are going underground. They are going to remote places. So keep a plan B. And Israel should not be the only one who should keep a plan B. It is a costly plan B, and it should also encourage the U.S. to have such kind of capability in case such an uh, event will happen. An, an extremely costly plan B, um, if that's military action on the table. Efrat, um, what, what can we make? These are all bad options. What's your take on a, on a possible plan B? Well, I absolutely agree with Shaul that we must always be, be prepared, whether to, it, it, ideally it would be within a coalition, but preparation is always key. And if, if worst comes to the worst, any sovereign nation would uh, consider its own defence on its own. In, 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 and by no means would that be an ideal scenario. Um, and, and when it comes to the US, I think there's also just following on from, from Shaul's um, very interesting words, that um, it's, it's also a matter of leadership. And so I, I'm, I'm, and as the Biden administration is aware, there is rarely an appetite for foreign adventures by, by the US public. But that's where the role of leadership is. And um, wherever, historically, wherever the, the, the US has retreated from its res, re, responsibilities of leadership, um, the, the, the results have been far less than ideal. They've been, they've been very, very um, detrimental to the US national interest. And so in a way, it's the part of, of the US leadership and any US administration at the time to guide, its, uh, to guide its population and to explain its policies, why it is engaged in the Middle East, why it is important. And also to be, um, if we're looking at it within a broader perspective, to also understand the, the, um, the Iranian psyche and to be attuned to the culture. And so whenever going into negotiations, to know that you're going, um, that you're in dialogue on, on, on very critical ex existential matters with um, very, very skilled negotiators who have historically invented the rules of negotiating. And so to have, to have that respect for the skill and, and respect for that, you know, plan B than one hopes to never use. Also, that's where the scope comes in for covert action. And so to be more creative in, in, in covert action to, to prevent Iran from becoming a military, uh, a nuclear power. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to pull together a few final questions, uh, if I may. One touches on the Abraham Accords. And of course, um, many have indicated that the Abraham Accords have really come out of uh, Iranian influence. Um, my enemy's enemy is my friend certainly seems to have um, birth what have become extremely positive relations uh, between the Abraham Accords countries uh, and Israel. Um, but to what extent uh, can we rely, the questioner asks, upon such accords um, with those states 
uh, given their underlying or should we say previous ideology, which has been towards the elimination of Israel. Um, and when we look to the Abraham Accord countries on the one hand, may I also pose the question in relation to how we in the West, uh, so US, Europe, Israel, uh, can have any confidence that Iran will abide by any agreement that is reached. We've already talked about the ability to monitor and, for and enforce them. Uh, but in particular, in the context of the West, whether there is a role for the UK. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, Shaul, if I could ask you first about the Abraham Accords countries and, and second, whether you do think there is anything that the government of the United Kingdom might be doing. Uh, I think that the Abraham Accord uh, came after the uh, Gulf state realized that the US is retreating from the Middle East and they try to find some ways uh, and they assume that Israel is, uh, let's say, very close to the US. So it's not because Israel behaves in a good manner. It's uh, because uh, in, a pol in a politics, you should uh, select somebody that supports you. In the contrary, you can see Iran. And I think that uh, these states, they are trying to see whether the Abraham Accord is provide them with more security as they get more support from the West and especially from the US. And if they uh, proceed that this is the case, then they will continue it. Uh, today, I heard that the Qatar, who was a rivalry for Israel, they are now trying to help Israel to negotiate with the Hamas. They are putting some restrictions. But once they will realize that it will not be uh, good for them to maintain some relation, they will quit this accord. That's my assumption. There is also some kind of question which I would like to, to touch on it. And this is the Palestinian issues because some of this country mentioned that the Israel should solve the people with the Palestinian Authority. So these are two different questions, but uh, if I can give my assumption or uh, forecast is that uh, these countries will be will stick to the Abraham Accord till it will be uh, good for them to do such a thing. If they will find that Iran influence in the region has become bigger and bigger, US is not influencing, is not uh, going to support them, then they will quit it. And in that context, what can the UK be doing? Or, or is it simply on the sidelines? Hello? Look, for instance, I'll take a, a, a lot, an example. 1994, there was the, the Ukraine who came in the Budapest the agreement and said, we would like to get rid of our nuclear weapon because we would like to be a Western oriented country. country. There was two depositories to the NPT, the US and UK. And they said, we will come to assist you if you will be attacked, what is happening now? So you ask UK as well as the US should sometimes uh, go and assist the countries, put the pressure, even though for European convenience and the UK convenience, it will not be good. They should stick to their, uh, let's say, uh, policy and the Western threat. Thank you. Efrat, some final words from you on those two questions of the Abraham Accords and the ability of the UK to contribute po positively here. Well, so far, I, I, in, 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 in my experience of, of those engaged in the Abraham Accords, there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of very frank and open discussions, which I think is very encouraging. Hopefully that does um, produce fruits and, um, and, and help uh, towards uh, more stability and security in the region. And I think it, it was very interesting just before the Abraham Accords to see the alarm in Gulf states at the, um, at, at the lack of action um, that the United States um, didn't make. And so there was a lot of concern. And whereas Israel was uh, seen as the, the, power, the regional power that could be dependent, depended on to retaliate. So it's, it's, it'll be very interesting to see how that pans out. 
On the British front, I think what it, what could be very interesting, and again, it depends on what the US will be doing with terrorist designation of the IRGC, for example, would bring in the if the UK government were to adopt the the IRGC as a terrorist organization it would put in very tangible sanctions against both individuals and the organization um, and the organization itself which i think would give law enforcement agencies a lot more teeth to be able to act against an iranian threat which um, some evidence has, has shown has been proven to uh, to kill UK nationals, unfortunately, and um, there has been evidence of, of uh, attempted Iranian influence within the UK. And so it, it would be within the UK's national interest to bring that into law. So there are tangible things that can be done. I know that there are many in our audience that will be taking that firmly on board. Thank you both ever so much for such a topical contribution. We'll be watching closely in the coming weeks the developments um, in terms of the US negotiations with Iran. We've had the, the dream team from the Esri Center uh, at um, Haifa University. Tremendously grateful to you both for joining us. Um, and we'll be back with a further webinar next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Thank you.